Today, we're sharing an episode about food allergies that was previously recorded in 2019. Our guest today is Rushi Gupta, Professor of Pediatrics and Director of the Center for Food Allergy and Asthma Research, which was founded in June 2019. Since this episode aired, a new treatment for food allergy has been approved by the FDA called Palforzia, which is used to treat peanut allergy. There are other treatments currently available for families, and the Center for Food Allergy and Asthma Research has many resources on its website. Learn more at feinberg.northwestern.edu slash C-F-A-A-R. Erin Spain is host of the show, and she'll take it from here. But before we get started, please subscribe and ring the bell to be notified of new videos. Thanks for joining me today. So glad to be here. Thank you. You're an expert on childhood food allergies and asthma, leading much of the current research on this topic. But your most recent paper in JAMA Open Network focused on adults with food allergies. Why the shift to adults? That's a great question, uh, as I am a pediatrician. But, uh, you know, over the years, we've been studying, like you said, pediatric food allergy. And that's where the emphasis has been. But now a lot of those kids are growing up and they're becoming adults and they're going to college and they continue to have their food allergy. And then, you know, at meetings with other physicians, you start hearing about how many adults seem to be developing food allergies as adults. And since we had the expertise in doing large-scale prevalence studies, we thought we would modify our pediatric study for adults and really understand, you know, how many uh, people in the United States are affected by food allergy and what that looks like. So we really didn't have good data on how many adults. No, no. We, we have very little data on adults with food allergy. Some reason we've all really focused on the kids. So this paper that came out did make some headlines. You know, you found that nearly half of adults, they developed adult onset food allergies. And was that surprising to you? So surprising. I mean, we knew, like I said, you keep hearing it, right? Anecdotally in clinic, uh, you start hearing and seeing more and more adults talking about how they're developing these food allergies. But the number we found was very surprising. I mean, we really found that about half, 48%, said they developed at least one new food allergy as an adult that they didn't have as a child. Uh, so those numbers were a little astonishing. Additionally, about one in four adults said they developed an allergy as an adult and never had a food allergy as a child. So that's, that's a lot of adults developing new, new allergies. And the allergies are similar to what we see in children. There's milk, peanuts, Tree nuts, fin fish, egg, wheat, soy, sesame, those are among the most common. But mm -hmm. for some reason, shellfish is at the top of the list for adults. Do we know why that is? That is such a good question. And I think, you know, my favorite thing about doing research is once you do a study, it opens up like 100 more that you can do and answer new questions. But uh, you're absolutely right. The top eight, we used to call it. Now we call it the top nine because sesame is becoming you know, the ninth most common allergen, those are the same in kids and adults, but the adults have a very different order, with shellfish being way beyond other foods. I think 2.9% of adults reported having a shellfish allergy. Um, it was the most common allergen in adults by far, because after that, it was milk and peanut around 1.8, 1.9. So, um, what is it about shellfish? You know, like what? And I've heard from so many adults, oh, my gosh, I love shellfish and I can't eat them anymore. Uh, and that is that's really hard for a lot of people. But we I think now need to explore, like, what is it about the proteins and shellfish and what's so unique about the specific food that it's causing so much adult onset allergy? Well, the interesting thing about this study is it was a survey. It's a survey you said you've used for children before, and it's self-reported. So people, you know, say, well, I think I have a food allergy or I have a food allergy. <laughs> Tell me about that, because 20 percent of the adults reported having a food allergy, but you determined that it was only actually half of them that seemed to have a real allergy. It was more like a sensitivity from how they reported, um, how they reacted to the food. Tell me about that. Yeah, and I really appreciate you asking this question, because I think this has been one of the most confusing uh, questions that's come up in the media and how people take it. So like you said, it's a survey. So people were asked, adults were asked, 
you know, uh, do you have a food allergy? And then if they said yes, it went into what food allergies, right? So it would ask specifically. So say you said you have peanut, milk, and wheat, all right? Then it would take you through each food. It would say for peanut allergy, what are your most severe symptoms that you've had? And then you would list them. And you could write in or you could choose from the list. And then it would ask you things about diagnosis and about emergency department use and about epinephrine use, right? So it asked you a series of questions. Then it would go into milk and it would ask you the same series of questions. And then it would go into wheat. So you had to be specific for each food. Now, what we did with that data, because there are so many food-related conditions, right? You can have yeah. so many different things that look like a food allergy, but may not be. So what we did is we tried to do our best. We had an expert panel go through and try to clean uh, the data so that if there were things that may be something else. So say you said you have a milk allergy, but you said you just get um, stomach cramps and some diarrhea. Okay. Then we would say, well, we're not completely sure that's a food allergy and it might, it may be lactose intolerance. Uh So we would put it aside. Okay. So when people say they were wrong, that's not true. You know, the, say, the problem with food allergies, so let's go back to food allergies. The problem is, is that food allergies can impact any organ system, right? So you can have GI symptoms. In fact, it's one of the most common ones. Vomiting is one of the most common things that happen after you, as you have an allergic reaction. You can have skin symptoms, so you can get hives. You can have oral symptoms. You can get tightening of the throat and tingling Um, swelling of your mouth. Um, You can have respiratory symptoms. You can have trouble breathing, wheezing, um, tightness in the chest. Uh, You can even have cardiovascular, right, the drop in blood pressure. And the problem with food allergies is you can have these mild symptoms or you can have them progress to severe symptoms with the breathing difficulty and tightening of the throat, and that can be life-threatening. So when you people report only GI symptoms and we take them out, or they only report oral symptoms because sometimes you can have something called oral allergy syndrome where you're actually allergic to the pollen. So if you eat a fruit and you only get tingling and a little swelling and itching in your mouth, that's not a food allergy, but those could also be symptoms of a food allergy. So long story to tell you that what we really did was try to take a people who had symptoms that could look like an intolerance or oral allergy syndrome and take them out. And that was about half of the people. So whether they have a true food allergy, we're not sure. Whether they have an intolerance, we're not sure. But what it told us was that, can you believe that one in five adults think that they have a food allergy and do potentially have some food-related condition? That's a huge number. And it underscores the importance of getting that diagnosis and going to your doctor and really determining, is this a food allergy? And that was our goal by saying, look, there's one in five, but then of the convincing, there's only one in 20 that are getting diagnosed. And I understand this as an adult. You know, a lot of times what happens is you eat a food, you have a negative reaction, and you're like, well, I just can't eat that food I'm just going to avoid that now. Exactly. And you don't necessarily think, oh, Let me go get it checked out by a doctor. And I want this to help people think, let me go get it checked out by a doctor. Because avoiding foods in your diet is so hard, right? Trying to take out milk from everything you eat. I think for me, the goal was, you know, let's try to figure out what all these food-related conditions are so that you're not having to avoid a food unnecessarily. And if it is a true food allergy... You need to know how to manage it because that can be life-threatening and you need to know what type of reactions can happen and you need to carry your epinephrine with you. You touched on it a little bit with the shellfish. What is it about the shellfish? Is it the protein? What are some of the hypotheses out there about why more kids and adults are developing food allergies? I know there's some theories. You're one of the experts. What do you say? I know. And and this is what's, what's so interesting because we all know that genetics plays a role, right? But we would not have this epidemic and this huge increase if it was just genetics. So we need to better understand what is it in the environmental component that has changed over pretty much a generation that has caused this incredible increase. And um, so some theories are 
of course, the hygiene hypothesis, right? Like, are we becoming too too clean? clean? (laughs) Yes. The hand sanitizers, the soap. Yeah. Right. And it could very well be because our bodies are not exposed to things that are not fighting things they should. They're fighting things they shouldn't. You know, Um, there's a couple other really interesting hypotheses that are somewhat related. The microbiome, you've probably heard that. That's really hot right now. Um, So what is it about our gut bacteria And how much of a role does that play? And what are we doing to it? Um, You know, the whole idea of getting antibiotics early in life in that first year, all all the antibiotics infants are getting or mothers are getting during pregnancy. Other hygiene-related things, you know, C-section births are up, and so they're not going through the normal vaginal canal, and then they're not getting that natural bacteria. Is that hurting them? You know, is that part of that whole hygiene piece and the, the microbiome that is in their gut? Um, how do we eat? What are we eating these days? You know, are we eating locally grown food like before? No, we're eating from all over the world. What kind of pesticides are used? You know, the ideas of GMOs, like there, there are all these question marks that we haven't fully understood yet. And you're interested in looking into those? Yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I mean, you have to. I mean, I would love to help better understand what these factors are. I mean, chances are they're not one factor. We're not going to say, oh, it's all about this. It's it's going to be a group of factors and how our lifestyles have changed. I mean, the one big breakthrough that's happened is there was a, a large study done in London called the LEAP study, and they found that if you feed infants, high-risk infants, peanut products early in life, that you may be able to prevent peanut allergy. So that exposure through the gut early could be preventative. And so this was a really big uh, breakthrough because for the first time we have a way to potentially prevent it. Because before that, we told uh, pediatricians to tell families to avoid peanut products till age three, which is what I did with my daughter. And she has peanut allergies. Uh, (laughs) It was a very, very big finding to think that, okay, maybe by waiting we may be hurting. Triggering it somehow. Yeah. yeah. And now parents are giving those babies in the first, you know, six to 12 months a little bit of peanut butter. They should. They should. Absolutely. I mean, I think that is a very important finding. And all parents of infants should initiate peanut products, you know, watered down peanut butter um, early in life by that, you know, not the first food, uh, but in that first group of foods, like around six months for sure. And really, children, you're a pediatrician, as you mentioned. This is your focus, is children and allergies. How did you start down this path? You mentioned that your daughter has a peanut allergy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's an interesting story because I am a pediatrician, and I came to Northwestern and Lurie Children's 14 years ago to really study asthma disparities and to work with one of the leaders in the field that was here at that time. And I met a family actually, with two young children with very severe food allergies, Uh, been to the ER and hospitalized, and they really wanted research to be done in this area. And so I was, you know, junior faculty, (laughs) hey, you want to come in, you want to work on this. I knew very little about food allergies back then. But what I found was compared to asthma, which I had been studying, uh, there was a huge hole. We didn't even know how many as you know, we talked about, we didn't know how many kids had it, how many adults had it. We didn't know the basic prevalence or types of foods people were allergic to or what kind of symptoms. Like All that data was not in the literature. And so I was trained uh, in health services research and had my MPH, and I was fresh and ready to start. And I thought, you know, this may be an area that I could make a difference. And have an impact because so little was known. So that's how I I started. And then as I was studying it, uh, three years into it, I believe, my son, who loves peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, playing with my daughter, touched her, I guess, all over her face because she just broke out in hives. And you knew what it was immediately. Oh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And I'm like, wow, you know, what kind of gift is this? (laughs) But oh, my gosh, you know, it's really had such an amazing influence on my life and my career because There is a big difference um, just studying a condition and then living with a condition. And all the things I go through every day in my life with her uh, really do help influence the research. And then by having her, you know, I know so many others with food allergy and I'm in these support groups and 
and listening to what their needs are, right? Listening to that patient and that whole patient centeredness, it, it just really brings that home because they know what they need and we as researchers need to listen to them and answer their questions. So it's, it's, it's been a blessing <laughs> in some ways, um, but yeah, very difficult. How old is your um, daughter now? She's 12. Yeah. And is, is she still working through the peanut allergy? Because I know at some yeah. point a lot of people outgrow it. She is working through it. Um, only about 10 to 20 percent outgrow peanut allergy. Uh, it's been she's got peanut and tree nuts and she used to have an egg, which she has outgrown. Um, so it's it's a challenge every day because, you know, we don't have a severity spectrum for food allergies, which I think a lot of parents uh, it really affects their life because if you don't know my child is mild or moderate you know people ask you oh how how severe is it yeah right and we have nothing to tell them and so everyone's severe right everyone could have a life-threatening expecting the worst Mm -hmm. right so it's a lot of anxiety and fear for families because food is a part of everything kids do even adults well, you're doing so much to bring knowledge into the scientific community and build the literature. In 2011, you led a study that found that 8% of kids in the U.S. have at least one food allergy. This was new information, as you said, we didn't yeah. know before. And 40% of those kids had experienced a life-threatening reaction already in their lives. How important was this when you were able to actually put some numbers out there? It was really incredible to see what happened after that because... After that study, people had numbers that they could hold on to and tell their schools and see it in their classrooms. You know, 8% is about two in every classroom. It's about one in 13 kids. And when you picture it like that, you're like, oh, yeah, that's true. You know, there are about two kids in the class that have a food allergy. And and you realize how realistic this is and how how prevalent. And then by, by being able to list the foods and talk about the reactions, uh, I think it made more sense and it increased awareness and and people started to get it. And we actually repeated that study uh, that was published in pediatrics again in December of 2018. And what was interesting, the numbers are, are pretty comparable, but we asked this time about emergency department visits. And one interesting thing we found was of kids with food allergy, about one in five go to the emergency department every year for their food food-related reaction. So these are severe reactions, yeah. life-threatening re- reactions. Yeah, it, they they are having them. And, and so people would say, okay, you have a food allergy, but how much does it impact your life? And so for the first time, we were able to quantitate that yeah. and say, you know, one in five are going every year. So it's a, it's a big deal, and it's something that we have to take seriously. And help protect these kids. Well, and what is it? About 150 children, um, they actually die from the, the reaction. And that's something that you are trying to, so hard to prevent through education and awareness. Yeah. And that is, you know, every time that happens, like all of our hearts are broken and we want to prevent that from happening um, so badly. And not only the deaths, but even the severe reactions, because they throw you off course. You know, when you have one of those close calls, um, messes you up, you know, like, and, and it's hard to then go out to eat, do normal, normal things. Um, but what's so great, I feel like, you know, in the 14 years I've been in this field, I've never seen a field change so much. So the amount of research that's happening now, we actually have treatments that will be coming out this year. Wow. So, yeah. So, and a lot of the researchers at Lurie Children's are working on them. Uh, there is oral immunotherapy. So eating small amounts and increasing the dose, and that's going to hopefully be out later this year. Uh, it's already, it's in phase five, five clinical trials and uh, it's going to get, it feels very, very likely that it'll be on the market. Um, there's a patch, epicutaneous immunotherapy for peanut that's coming out. And then these companies are working on the next set of foods, the next most common foods. And then there's a couple other treatments that uh, I've heard of and that are in different phases of trial. So I feel like in the next five to 10 years, we'll have great treatments for food allergy. And then the other great thing, you know, that I've seen change over time in this 14 year period is the awareness has been picked up. Uh, Schools and Chicago public schools were one of the first to join this, uh, building policies, having stock epinephrine in case of an emergency. I mean, 
unfortunately, this all was sparked by, as you said, a, a young child um, dying in school after an anaphylactic reaction and there was no epinephrine. And so after that, you know, CPS said, we're not going to ever let this happen again. Yeah. And they passed a law to have stock epinephrine in every CPS school. And then all through the country, I think every state now has a law or a policy around stock epinephrine in schools. So to see policies develop, to see the community coming together to protect kids and adults with food allergy so quickly is so inspiring. You said kids are sometimes the biggest advocates, classmates. They want to help protect their friends. Yes. And to that, you know, we do three areas of research, the epidemiology that we've talked about. We do a lot of the clinical care, kind of that early introduction um, stuff that we talked about. And then the third big bucket we have is community. So we work very closely with the schools, and we've actually developed videos that are free on our website uh, for schools to use around how to teach a classroom about food allergies and how to have your peers be supportive and because what we found is that is the number one thing to protect these kids is if they have that peer support and not the bullying, right? Because bullying is also very common. Yeah. But if we can take it to developing more peer understanding and peer support, um, it, it could change these kids' lives. Well, so. we'll make sure to put links to those videos on the podcast website so people can look them yeah, up and share them. That would be great. Well, this is fascinating. The past 14 years, as you mentioned, so much has changed, but it sounds like we are now at a point where there's going to be some real treatments, and uh, we're really looking forward to see what's coming next. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I am too. You know, I have a, a little cartoon on my wall at work, and it is um, what I hope to see. It's an adult talking to a kid. And the adults saying, you know, in my day, there were no food allergies because this is what you hear all the time. And then that kid grows up and is an adult and talking to another kid and saying, you know, in my day, there were food allergies. So hopefully that's where we're headed yeah. and hopefully I can help be a part of that. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Ruchi Gupta, for coming and sharing your research with us today. My pleasure. Thank you. You can follow us on Twitter at NUFeinbergMed. Subscribe and ring the bell to hear about the latest groundbreaking research and discoveries. Thanks for listening.